Okay, Shalom Koram. I'll give this talk in English. Uh, my name is Nufar Gadulter. I'm going to present my first chapter in my uh, PhD. And under the advisor, the, my advisors are Professor Amat Sagnan, Professor Nam Levine, and Dr. Kami Thomas. And the first, first chapter is about uh, remote sensing techniques, which will help um, trace life forms in harsh environments and the Dead Sea Stromatolite reefs as a case study. So first of all, what are stromatolites? Uh, except from being a really long word, it's a laminated biosedimentary structures and they're forming and um, fossilizing from environments of uh, microbial communities, microbial mats, in shallow water environments. And those microbial communities are usually uh, constructed by a first layer, top layer of <laughs> photosynthetic microbial uh, communities. And the deep layers are usually anaerobic my microbi microbial communities, both which uh, helps with precipitation and binding and trapping uh, sediment. So the location on the map is where I've sampled the stromatolites. And thanks to Yaniv Dalvasi, I also have a drone orthophoto in a very high resolution. Um, maybe it's a little bit hard to see, but on the left, it's the stromatolites reef. And on the right, it's the neighboring layer, the dolomites, which I will uh, later on call them two groups that I will classify as one stromatolite, zero dolomites. And uh, according to the abundance of stromatolites in the uh, geological record, uh, the Dead Sea ancient shorelines have, uh, have, uh, have had uh, much better conditions for them to flourish in, in the past. So, um, the, the fascination or the interest around uh, stromatolites is uh, basically trying to see and understand if we can trace ancient life forms. And the main interest now is um, when looking for ancient life forms on extraterrestrial planets, um, we're looking for something who might look like stromatolites. So comparisons has been made by some researchers and for example, this specimen from Mars was compared with stromatolites from Thetis Lake in Australia and some formations that might be resembling layers of microbial mats. And so those are samples from the Dead Sea. Some of them might look much more laminated as the one in the middle and some might look much more cauliflower shaped. And the, well, the research with uh, remote sensing techniques and stromatolites actually started in Australia where they are preserved and they are in preservations and usually cannot be touched or sampled. So that's where it all began. And uh, remote sensing techniques have uh, showed some important and uh, quantitative and textural information which cannot be detected with visual inspection. So my research purpose is basically seeing if we can automated uh, uh, classify, classify sorry, stromatolites uh, from their neighboring layers in the sampling site in Mount Zor in the Dead Sea and um, developing such a classification might help with uh, further automated mapping in the future. So the workflow was collecting samples and collect the hyperspectral data with a spectrometer and a hyperspectral camera. Then building a model uh, of uh, machine learning uh, tools uh, to see if there is a possibility to predict uh, a stromatolite out of the hyperspectral data. Um, further steps would be acquiring data with airborne um, tools like a drone or uh, any other imagery. 
And so the data set is comprised with 100 samples. Half of them are stromatolites, the other half are dolomites. And the wavelengths uh, that I have acquired are uh, 2,150 wavelengths from 300, uh, 350 nanometer to 2,500 nanometer, which which is from the UV to far infrared. And most of the samples are around um, the size of 10 to uh, 30 centimeters. And spectra looks like that. That's the hyperspectra of stromatolite and dolomite on the right. And maybe some of you can see already that there's differences between the chemical com compositions, but is it enough to see if we can automate it automate the classification. Right, so when dealing with machine learning tools, the most important thing, like the first rule, is to prevent false discoveries and overfitting, which I've guaranteed that I'm doing with cross-validation and randomizing and shuffling the data. The data was uh, divided to uh, a test group and a train group. And sorry, I've used uh, three classifiers also to cross-validate. So the first one was linear regress regression. Second one was XGBoost, which is a decision tree. And the third one was K nearest neighbors classifier. And then the next set step was to see if there is a possibility to classify the stromatolites with less data, actually, and to optimize the classification. So I've used UMAP algorithm, and it's called dimensionality reduction, and dimensions here are the wavelengths. So if I'm using the most optimum wavelengths to classify the stromatolites, then I'm facilitating the whole process and making it much more practical. So uh, the results of the three classifiers, um, linear regression, XGBoost, and k nearest neighbors have predicted quite well the stromatolites on the blue. And most of the stromatolites, basically more than 90%, were predicted as stromatolites, which that means true positive ratio. And true negative would be the um, dolomites, where, which were predicted with a bit of a lower uh, rate but that could be implied of the, um, how the data or how the dolomites that I've collected are similar to each other chemically. So here we can learn that the stromatolites are similar to each other chemically. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the result of the dimensionality reduction. So to make it easy, um, the result basically says 10 dimensions, 10 wavelengths are enough, uh, are predicting well enough which are the stromatolites and which are the dolomites. So there is a possibility to reduce the data set and make it optimized. So now I'm gonna, uh, now I wanted to see which wavelengths were the most uh, important. So in order to do that, I, yeah, um, in order to do that, I've used the feature importance. And um, so higher rates, which are like the, the dots, the blue dots uh, in the graph, um, showing me the most important features, the most important wavelengths which were used in the model to classify between the two groups and to distinguish the stromatolites from the dolomites. And they're all lying around the wavelengths of 1,800 1, nanometer to 2,250 nanometer. And now when we know where all the wavelengths are, we can dive uh, in and see what is the chemical components that are reflecting those wavelengths, in those wavelengths. So to summarize, um, integration of hyperspectral remote sensing methods with machine learning methods is rather a new take. I uh, tried to make the, a, a big data set instead of sampling only 
four to ten uh, stromatolites, which were was done in uh, um, research in Australia before, and so developing those uh, techniques and trying to optimize the uh, subset of which wavelengths could be the footprint of um, the stromatolites can ultimately achieve the goal of automated mapping of traces of uh, ancient life forms on Earth or on Mars. Um, so further and future work would be uh, combining my hyperspectral data from the hyperspectral camera. Uh, that's a photo of how uh, it's been collected. And uh, so upscaling the data set and running the machine learning tools on a bigger data set on other sites of sampling and yes, thank you. imagery for, from Mars, but uh, if it's carbonate and uh, the chemical components are similar, then that's what's important. <laughs> it's the biggest question, right? I, I only worked on that. How many carbonates are on תודה רבה. תודה רבה.